On this Monday, Thursday, as we remember our Lord's last evening with his disciples before his crucifixion, we reflect on the great lengths to which God has sought and found us, those who were lost and rebellious, and reconciled us to himself. In today's lesson, our text focuses on the prophet Isaiah's heart of concern for his own lost people and his appeal to God through intercessory prayer on their behalf. While Isaiah has been given the most magnificent vision of God's redemptive plans for history and the consummation of God's kingdom in the new creation, the prophet's heart is still heavy for those in his own day and those who will find themselves in exile and beyond, who feel far from and forgotten by God. And as is so often the pattern of intercession in scripture, this prayer is anchored first by remembering the faithfulness of God in the past. Let's look at chapter 63, verse seven. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to his steadfast love. Notice that this verse begins and ends with the Lord's hesed, his unfailing love. This is the North Star, the fixed point from which Isaiah's prayer will flow. He begins with the character of God, then moves to recall how the Lord has acted on his people's behalf throughout history. In verses 8 and 9, Isaiah recalls God's faithfulness to his people. He saved them, redeemed them, and carried them. He shared in their afflictions, Notice the deep relationship that is being described. The word for love in verse 9, Abba, is used here just this once in Isaiah. It describes a love which delights in the company of the loved one. This could never be said of a distant cold deity such as the pagans worshipped, but rather describes the tender, loving God who has been with them, delivered them, sustain them, and who delights to be with them. Notice it was the angel of his presence which saved them. This indicates a visible representation of God, perhaps like the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire. He had been all in with them, delighting in them. Verse 10, but they rebelled. This is the unvarnished truth of sin, In our day, we often like to put this more gingerly, letting ourselves down gently. We might call sin baggage. We might say, I messed up. We might blame shift. We might rationalize. We might say, everybody does it. Or maybe just say, we are woefully inept. But God says, we are rebels. As C.S. Lewis said, fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. And furthermore, by rebelling, they had grieved his Holy Spirit. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit because he is a transcendent, purely righteous, holy being who longs to be in relationship with his people. He is holy in himself and capable of producing holiness in others. However, the Holy One cannot be in fellowship with the unholy. Therefore, He turned to be their enemy and fought against them. God must and will preserve his holiness. To rebel against God is to become his enemy. Verse 11, then he remembered. In scripture, when we read about God remembering, it's not to say he had forgotten and then he recalled. Rather, it means he's decided to act based upon what he's done in the past. In this case, God remembers the days of old when he had delivered his people from Egypt by the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, his appointed shepherds leading them. Micah 6 says these shepherd leaders were Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. That's a shout out to the women. He had provided the means by which his spirit could dwell among them by instituting the tabernacle system of worship. His glorious arm had empowered Moses to work miracles and to make God's everlasting name known. God's name encompasses his character, which is to be known by the entire world. 
God had faithfully led them through the wilderness into the promised land where his spirit gave them rest. All of this was again to make his glorious name known. Julia in verse 15, this prayer shifts from recalling God's faithfulness and his people's sinfulness to make the intercessor is making his request of God now. Look down and see from your holy and beautiful habitation. He is asking for the Lord's full attention. Then the request takes on the form of a lament on behalf of the community when he asks God some very pointed questions. Where are your zeal and your might? His zeal is his passionate commitment to do something for his people. His might is his power to act on their behalf. Then he proclaims that the stirring of your inner parts and your compassion are being held back. These images refer to deep gut level emotions he expects God to have on their behalf. He's not feeling God's love for the people at this point in time. John of the Cross referred to this experience as the dark night of the soul. This is the soul-bearing honesty of Isaiah's perception of the situation. However, Isaiah wisely circles back to proclaim what he knows to be true about God. Verse 16, For you are our Father. The use of Father is a very unique title for God in the Old Testament, and here we see it twice in one verse. As we all know, Jesus used Father to describe his relationship to God, which incensed the Jewish leaders of his day, and they accused him of blasphemy. Jesus went on to tell his followers to address God in this way as well. Well, centuries earlier, Isaiah was surprisingly referring to God in this manner. How did Isaiah understand this term? He may be referring back to another reference, Deuteronomy 32.6, where Father is equated with Creator, the one who made and sustained them. But in this case, he goes on to describe his meaning as, Our Redeemer from of old is your name. As we've said, Redeemer is the term for the closely related one who buys a relative's freedom or restores another's inheritance. Isaiah sees this close Redeemer relative as Father. It is his name. Or his character. While acknowledging this unique relationship, Isaiah's complaint against God continues. In verses 17 through 19, Isaiah makes three points. One, we are stuck in a sin pattern because you are not helping us and have hardened our hearts. Two, we cannot appropriately worship you because our sanctuary lies in ruins. And three, we look like everyone else that doesn't have a relationship with you. He's not claiming that the people are not culpable for their sin, but he sees their situation as utterly helpless without God's intervention. And so his plea continues in chapter 64. Here he doesn't only want God to look down from heaven. Even more, he wants him to rend the heavens open and come down to earth and make his powerful presence known by shaking the mountains violently. This inbreaking would take all by surprise, like a spark that kindles a brush fire or heat that makes water boil suddenly. In verse 4, he proclaims that no other God is capable of such things. Israel's God is in a class by himself who acts for those who wait for him. To wait is to display the kind of trust that is willing to commit itself to God over the long haul, knowing that God will eventually act on one's behalf. Verse 5 shows that this is an active waiting. The one waiting joyfully works righteousness as he remembers God and his ways, trusting that God will meet him. But of course, the very righteousness required can only come from God himself. Isaiah continues, In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? Is there hope for these people? Melody, Isaiah's lament for his people continues in verse 6. Yes, while hoping for salvation, Isaiah continues to acknowledge the sinful condition of his people. They persist in sin and are helpless to do anything about it. 
Perhaps remembering his own helplessness when faced with God's holiness in chapter 6, Woe is me, for I am lost. He sees the defilement of sin upon all the people like a polluted garment, literally a menstruation cloth, which is stained and cannot become clean. He then uses the metaphor of a leaf, which has been disconnected from the life-giving source of a tree and is fading only to be taken away by the wind, like one carried away by sin. In verse 7, there is no one who calls upon your name. They are so far gone that they no longer even reach out to God. Their very name, Israel, was given for one who had wrestled with God, refusing to let go. Now the people named wrestles with God do not even acknowledge him. Then the prophet heartbreakingly exclaims, For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. From his perspective, the circumstances are such that God appears to be hidden from them and their sins have overtaken them. They are doomed. Just when it feels helpless, we get to verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. He's recalling that beloved title of close relationship again. The child would not even exist were it not for the father. You are the potter, we are the clay. Please remake us into something beautiful and useful again. Verse 9, be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Isaiah is asking for there to be a limit to God's righteous anger by appealing to their relationship. We are all your people. Hereby, Isaiah is recalling what has been a dominant theme in his book. God's righteous judgment is not an end in and of itself, but it is intended to have an ultimate redemptive purpose in cleansing and restoring the people to himself. Isaiah is praying for this to happen. The first part of the appeal was for the people. The second part of this appeal is for the place. Verses 10 and 11 express a longing for God to restore his holy house and the, his holy city, which would be destroyed before the Babylonian exile, so he may once again be praised. Verse 12, will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? But perhaps what Isaiah couldn't fully appreciate in his despair was that God's holding back or his restraint was not an act of callous indifference but of mercy, because when he acts, there will be judgment. Instead of looking around and within, Isaiah is now looking up, and now God responds to Isaiah's prayer in chapter 65. Yes, he does. And the first thing God needs to clear up is some mistaken assumptions that have been made about him. Far from hiding from them, the Lord declares, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am. God responds, I have gone out of my way to make myself known, even to those who aren't looking for me, even to the nations that have never heard of me. In verse 2, he says, with regard to Israel, I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people. To spread out the hands is to adopt an attitude of prayer. Imagine this reversal. Rather than his people spreading out their hands and pleading with God, he has spread out his hands to them, pleading with them to return to him. Contrary to what Isaiah has assumed, God does not forget his people, or any people for that matter. He has outstretched arms and a welcome for any who will turn from their sins in repentance toward him. The picture of the loving father in the parable of the prodigal son comes to mind. When his wayward son returns, the father who has been waiting and scanning the horizon for his lost son runs to him at first sight and welcomes him home with joy and celebration. The Apostle Paul actually quotes verses 1 and 2 in Romans 10 as he explains God's heart for all people and his disposition toward Israel. Lest we be too hard on Isaiah and his misunderstanding of God's posture toward his people, we need to acknowledge that his experience is one that is common to all believers from time to time, feeling far from and forgotten by God. 
Perhaps this is a text to return to when that is your situation. Just like Isaiah needed God to reorient him to the reality of his disposition of wide stretched open arms toward his people, so too we need that reorientation from time to time. Hear him say, here I am, here I am. What is separating you or me from God isn't his hiddenness. Sometimes it is simply our perspective. We expect God to show up according to our expectations, but often he's showing himself in unexpected ways. Why can't we sense him? Sometimes it's the painful circumstance that we just can't see past. Sometimes we've isolated ourselves, cutting ourselves off from the body of Christ. Sometimes we look inward rather than looking up. Other times, as was the case with Israel, it is sin. Again, God names it rebellion in verse 2, and it is taken on the most debased forms of idol worship, offending God continually, verse 3. Rather than respecting God's holiness, they had adopted all sorts of pagan rituals and engaged in all sorts of unclean behavior. Ironically, in verse 5, they see themselves as holier than thou. They've adopted a sort of religion that makes them feel superior and holy while actually being utterly offensive to the truly holy one. There is no holiness apart from God. Any attempts to become holy on our own only result in defilement. Jackman reminds us, pursuing their own imaginations is always the nub of the problem of human rebellion. We will not let God be God in our lives. We would much rather create our own fictional alternatives. That is why so many people still cling to the attitude. I like to think God is, or more defiantly, I cannot believe in a God who, as though personal capability was the measure of anything eternally significant. These verses are very much like the charges Isaiah brought against the people at the beginning of the book in chapter 1 where their corrupted worship had become so burdensome to him. Melody, what is the just penalty for such brazenness? Verses 6 and 7 tell us the Lord cannot keep silent. He will repay into their lap or into their bosom. In other words, the repayment will be experienced in the very center of their beings. And the repayment will be both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together. This seems to indicate that their guilt becomes more aggravated as time passes with each generation as the downward spiral of sin accelerates. Verse 8 explores the question, will everyone be swept up in the judgment? The metaphor of the grapes shows juicy grapes among the defiled grapes. All deserve the crushing wine press, but some are saved from it. That is the remnant. He refers to those he spares as my servants, for which there will be a blessing. As had been promised from Genesis 3.15 through Genesis 22.17 and throughout the Old Testament, the offspring or the seed will spring forth from Jacob, and this chosen remnant will dwell in the place of blessing. In verse 10, we have a picture of restoration and transformation. Sharon, a land to the west, and Achor, an area to the east, indicates the entirety of the land will be a blessing for my people who have sought me. A sharp contrast is drawn here between those who have sought the Lord and those who have forsaken Him in verse 11. The latter have forgotten the Lord's holy mountain and instead set a table for fortune and fill cups of mixed wine for destiny. Now, destiny was a well-known Syrian god named Gad, and fortune was an unknown god. They represent the effort common to humans to want to control their own futures rather than entrusting themselves to God's control. There's a play on words in verse 12. Those who had worshipped destiny are actually destined for the sword, while those who've bowed down to set a table for fortune will actually bow down to slaughter, because when I called you, You did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen, but you did what was evil in my eyes. The irony here is that false religion actually brings the opposite of what it seems to promise. 
By trying to be the ultimate controllers of their lives through false worship, they've ended up forfeiting their lives by forsaking the one who could save them. Jackman comments again, Clearly, there is much here for a believing remnant to seize in our current context of widespread denials of God's character and rejection of His Word in the contemporary visible church. The point at which things change is when we, when we start to seek God for Himself, to renew our own repentance on a daily basis, and to demonstrate our total dependence on God's mercy and grace in the place of our habitual self-reliance. Julia verses 13 and 14 show sharp and direct contrasts between those who've forsaken God and those who have sought Him, His servants. It is very stark indeed. Behold is again a tension-getting device demanding us to look. From the beginning chapters of Genesis, we've seen there is the way of blessing and the way of the curse. In the way of blessing, there is abundant provision and reasons to rejoice and sing with gladness. In the way of the curse, there will be intense deprivation, shame, despair, and a broken spirit. All humans were created to be blessed and to bring blessing, but the only path of blessing is in dependence on the Lord Himself. We've continually noted the names for God throughout Isaiah. In verse 16, He is called the God of truth. He is the one who blesses. God of truth is literally God of amen in Hebrew. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, the Apostle Paul makes this meaning abundantly clear. For every one of God's promises is yes, amen, in Him. Therefore, through Him, we also say amen to the glory of God. On this Monday, Thursday, we are abundantly grateful for the God of Amen, in whom all His promises are resounding yes in the beautiful servant and anointed conqueror. Mm -hmm.